Welcome to the Culture of Healthcare, an overview of the Culture of Healthcare. This is Lecture B. The component, the Culture of Healthcare, addresses professional expectations in healthcare settings, the organization of care within a clinical practice setting, privacy laws, and workplace relevant professional and ethical issues are covered. The objectives for an overview of the culture of healthcare are distinguish between disease and illness, discuss the relationship between health and the healthcare system, define culture in the classic sense as well as in the modern sense of the term, and what it means for culture to be partial, plural, and relative. Explain the concept of cultural competence. Compare the concepts of culture, cultural safety, and safety culture in the context of a healthcare organization. Describe the impact of multiple cultures in healthcare delivery interactions. Define acculturation in the context of a healthcare organization. And discuss the role of culture in health informatics. Welcome. This is the second of two lectures which serve as an introduction to the culture of healthcare and healthcare professionals. The two lectures are meant as an introductory unit for a multi unit set of curriculum materials on the culture of healthcare covering the people who work in healthcare, the settings in which healthcare is delivered, the practices and processes of healthcare delivery, some of the professional values, beliefs, and ethics which drive that behavior, and how health information technologies interact with healthcare professionals in their work. In the first lecture, we discussed what's meant by the word culture in reference to healthcare and healthcare professionals. In this second lecture, we'll discuss why this is important and how we can learn more about it. This slide presents a view of culture presented in the first lecture. Quote, culture refers to integrated patterns of human behavior that include the language, thoughts, communications, actions, customs, beliefs, values, and institutions of racial, ethnic, religious, or social groups, end quote. This is the definition provided by the United States Department of Health and Human Services, Office of Minority Health. In the first lecture, we modified this to describe healthcare culture as the language, thought processes, styles of communication, customs, beliefs, and institutions that characterize the profession of nurses, doctors, allied health workers, or clinic managers, etc. And we noted that these elements of culture are learned in part through participation in the customs, rituals, and rules of conduct, which are often not formal or explicit. Another aspect of a modern concept of culture is that it is always plural and always partial. Few of us belong to a single cultural group. For any particular type of person, group, or situation, there's usually more than one culture in play. No single cultural traditional reference can define or explain behaviors or interactions. Consider a middle-aged nurse from Texas who may participate in a particular religion, whose background may include particular educational or other experiences. The behavior of this nurse is unlikely to be completely explained by any one of these cultural elements. Some behavior may be a reflection of the professional culture of nurses and the type of provider setting the nurse worked in, such as a hospital, physician's office, or clinic. Other behavior may be a reflection of a Texas upbringing or a reflection of an MBA degree or experience as an engineer. The point is, to paraphrase Michael Agar, culture is always plural and always partial. Think about how this might relate to understanding culture in healthcare settings, where so many different professional, organizational, and other cultures interact on a day to day basis. Now we'll turn our attention to ethnography. Ethnography is the anthropologist's practice and description of what life is like in any local world or a specific setting in a specific society, usually one different from that of the anthropologist. Typically, an ethnographer visits a foreign place, learns the language, and systematically describes the social patterns in a particular village, neighborhood, or network. Critical to this work is the great importance placed on understanding the native's point of view, understanding how the behaviors, practices, and language make sense to the natives themselves, as opposed to what they mean to the outsider doing the observation. 
Ethnography emphasizes engagement with people and with the practices they undertake in their local worlds. To understand the culture or cultures of healthcare, we can adopt the approach of an ethnographer trying to understand language, behaviors, and practices in terms of what they mean to the natives, in this case, the nurses, doctors, therapists, clinic managers, and others who make up a modern, complex healthcare system. Important insights into another culture or differences between two cultures are gained when we pay attention to what Agar calls rich points. Rich points are the behaviors that highlight cultural differences. Consider, for example, the language used to describe the persons we deal with. A person may be referred to by doctors as patient, by counselors and therapists as client, by the business office as customer, by the medical librarian as patron, and by the IT department as user. We also find healthcare consumer as another term to describe patients and their families. The differences in language suggest differences in the assumptions about the status of individuals, their goals, their relationship, and so forth. Sometimes terms which may seem neutral in one context or from a particular cultural reference point may be positive or negative when taken from another cultural perspective. An example is the conventional use of the term chief complaint by physicians. To physicians, this is an entirely neutral term which refers to the key symptoms or conditions which brought the patient to see the doctor, the problem which the patient would like solved. To others, however, the word complaint may connote a more negative implication that the person is complaining or whining. Not long ago, a physician was doing a sabbatical in informatics and worked within the office setting of an informatics department. This physician used the assumptions and behaviors of his profession in the new role. For example, with pager alerts, the physician reaches for the nearest desk phone or uses his mobile phone to immediately place a call. For workers in this particular office setting, this behavior is completely unacceptable since a desk telephone belongs to a given individual and it's not okay for anyone to walk up and use the desk phone without first asking. Also, stopping in the middle of a conversation to take or accept a cell phone call is also considered unacceptable. This is a rich point that can give us insight into differences between the cultures across departments within one organization. In a clinical department, most equipment, including telephones, is available to everyone. Picking up the nearest phone if no one is using it to make a call is normal behavior. This physician's behavior, based on a clinical department's beliefs and assumptions, resulted in a conflict with the normal beliefs and assumptions of the new office setting. This rich point is an example of a behavior that highlights cultural differences. The cultural difference in this case is the assumption in an office setting that pieces of equipment belong to or are assigned to specific individuals, compared with the assumption in a hospital setting that most pieces of equipment belong to no one in particular and are shared by all. The same difference in assumptions can occur when health information technology, or HIT, implementations in the hospital bring with them office-based assumptions about assignment and ownership. In an office setting, computers are often assigned to specific individuals and owned by them, an assumption that may be enforced in the way that each machine is configured for a specific individual. This assumption doesn't translate well into the hospital setting, where individuals move from ward to ward, from desk to desk, from computer to computer, and all computers must essentially serve all individuals. Configuration for a specific individual simply breaks down. The point here is that much can be learned by chasing these rich points, by exposing ourselves to other cultures, usually through field work or site visits, we notice these rich points or differences in behavior that seem to make no sense given our own cultural assumptions and values. The job then is to chase these rich points and translate the meaning from one culture to another. Culture then is not a property of them or of us, but rather a translation between the two. And it's never a complete translation, it's always partial. This applies to traditional cultural translation, such as translating from traditional healing practices to modern Western biomedicine. It can also apply to professional cultural translation, such as translating from the culture of health professionals to that of information technology or IT professionals. 
At times, there may be resistance to the idea of achieving or studying cultural competence. Whether we're talking about health professionals learning cultural competence for their interactions with patients, or about health informatics professionals learning cultural competence for their interactions within the healthcare system. When medical students encounter the cultural competence curriculum, we sometimes encounter this resistance expressed in a statement such as, I didn't come to medical school to learn this, and we have more important things to worry about. This resistance also comes from a certain degree of ethnocentrism or denial of one's own culture or cultural bias. It also comes from stereotyping and oversimplifying the cultures of others, failing to recall that culture is not monolithic, but relative, plural, and partial, as discussed earlier. Finally, it comes from othering, that is, treating persons in another group that's different from one's own group, which is taken to be normal, and then labeling, marginalizing, or excluding those in the other culture. In healthcare, we sometimes encounter these forms of resistance. In health informatics, we can also encounter the same forms of resistance, the idea that we have more important things to worry about in our informatics training, the ethnocentrism or cultural bias that grounds us in our own culture, the tendency to stereotype and oversimplify members of other cultures, such as health professionals, and the tendency toward othering by defining people who are different, for example, nurses, doctors, therapists, etc., and labeling marginalizing, or excluding them. Perhaps you've seen examples of this in the organizations in which you've worked. Let's assume you're convinced that the study of healthcare culture is important to successful development, implementation, and maintenance of health information technology for patients and clinicians. Also, you believe that understanding people and processes is critical to successful HIT. How can you learn more? Where should you look? You are likely to learn more by observing the people in healthcare, the places where they work, their work processes and practices, their values and beliefs, and their interactions with technologies, including not just computer technology, but other technologies as well. When considering the people, you should include not only health professionals, but everyone else that participates in the healthcare processes. Places where healthcare takes place are varied from modern tertiary academic medical centers to small primary care and community clinics to long-term care facilities and, of course, patients' own homes. When studying healthcare processes and practices, it's not only important to characterize what people do or their workflow, but also to understand why they do things in the ways that they do them. Understanding values requires not only examination of explicit written and spoken values, but also values that seem to be implicit or that can be inferred from behavior, especially when conflicts arise. Finally, there's much to be learned from examining the interaction of people in the healthcare system with the technologies that help them do their work. As Ed Hutchins has said, quote, we cannot know what the task is until we know what the tools are, end quote. In learning more about the culture of healthcare, it's important that we keep our cultural assumptions from hindering practical understanding. Remember that modern anthropology rejects the idea of isolated societies with fixed sets of beliefs. There's no single culture of biomedicine. Rather, the culture of healthcare is the interaction and intersection of many diverse professional, organizational, and other cultures. We need to avoid stereotyping assuming that individuals always and only exhibit behaviors of a single monolithic culture, because this may get in the way of solving the problem. We can translate these ideas from cultural competency to the interaction between health information technology and health informatics and health professionals, rejecting the idea of an isolated society with a set of beliefs. This helps us focus on issues rather than cultural stereotypes whether they are stereotypes about professional culture or other cultures. To wrap up, we can consider several examples of the type of field studies we've been discussing that have been used in biomedical informatics. This work dates back at least to early ethnographic studies of work practices, which informed the design of computer workstations, such as the work of Danielle Fafchamp and the late Diana Forsyth. The American Medical Informatics Association gives an annual Diana Forsyth Award to the best studies of this type at its annual meeting. Other examples include studies of collaborative sense-making 
and information use in critical care and emergency care, such as those cited here by Forsyth, Ho, and Paul. Many studies of barcode medication technology have looked at its impact and side effects based on how it's actually used in the field, notably the work of Emily Patterson. Similarly, informal information sharing in critical care settings was described by Nancy Vukovic. The impact of computer order entry systems on doctor-nurse cooperation and cognition was examined by Marie Catherine Buscard Zafir and physician-patient interaction using exam room computers was studied using video ethnography by Bill Ventra and colleagues. These are just a few examples of the ways in which ethnographic approaches to the study of health professionals and their work practices have led to insights about the design and use of health information technology in healthcare settings. This concludes Lecture B of an overview of the culture of healthcare. In summary, let's enumerate some take-home points. First, effective health information technology requires understanding of the healthcare culture, including clinical settings, processes, and people. Second, a modern concept of culture is that it's always plural, always partial, and always relative, depending both on the observer and the observed. Third, rich points are behaviors or differences in behavior that give us insight into cultural differences and the why of work practices, including workarounds. Fourth, cultural competence is as important for health informatics as it is for health professionals, avoiding stereotypes, ethnocentrism, and othering. Finally, rich insights obtained from this kind of study can inform the design and evaluation of health information technology for clinical settings. This concludes an overview of the culture of healthcare. In summary, the unit defined culture in the classic sense and in the modern sense of the term, and what it means for culture to be partial, plural, and relative. The concept of cultural competence was examined. The concepts of cultural safety, safety culture, and just culture as applied to organizations were explained. This unit emphasized the importance of understanding multiple cultures that interact in healthcare delivery in the context of the student's own culture. It also looked at rich points and how they are used in the study of culture, defined acculturation and how it relates to working in healthcare settings, and illustrated the use of health informatics applications of the study of culture.